Good morning. <laughs> I'm so happy that you're here, and I'm so happy that we get to have this conversation together. Um, we are saving paper and trying to be really green about this. So the agenda is up here. It's a fairly simple agenda. We will start with uh, this call to order, then lighting the chalice. We will speak the covenant together, although Teresa read it to us earlier. We'll now have a chance all to say it together. And then I'll give you some background and comments. I think there are people who have not gotten sufficient information to feel comfortable moving forward. And we wanted to be sure that everybody has all the information. Um, we are wanting to be as transparent as possible. And some feedback we've gotten suggests that we haven't been as transparent as we thought we were. So now's the opportunity today to to get more and more transparent in our process. Um, then Dick will review the projects and the projected costs, and then we'll have a chance for questions and answers, then comments, and then we'll adjourn. So anything anybody needs to add to this agenda to complete it? Okay. So, um, Kathy? I know we just finished a service with people joining hands, but let's start this next chapter. Maybe start by joining hands as you feel comfortable doing so, just across the, the rows there while I light the chalice. And yes, it's a little less convenient. <laughs> May the flame we now kindle inspire us to heal more than harm, to help more than hinder, to bless more than curse, and to serve a spirit of freedom. Thank you. Thank you. Now if we could please speak this covenant together. As part of this beloved BUC community, I promise to strive to be my best self in all my interactions, assume the best intentions of everyone's actions, be mindful of our shared humanity in my communications, pause, reflect, and be part of the solution when things go awry. Thus do we covenant with one another. Thank you. I'd like for you to know that since our campaign began, more than $1.4 million in gifts has been pledged or contributed from 270 people. Your generosity represents the heart and vision of VUC. Thank you so much for your participation in this campaign. And it's never too late. So as we enter this conversation, I invite you to consider the following as a context for listening to the presentations and to one another. First of all, what do you need to know to decide how you think BUC should move forward into the future with this campaign and with these possibilities that are being presented today? So I'll say that again. What do you need to know to decide how you think BUC should move forward? Secondly, what is the legacy you wish to leave for future generations? Because this is a legacy-making kind of operation here. You may have noticed that. <laughs> so, you know, this sanctuary, which is a familiar and beloved place to us, was once dirt. There was nothing here. It was through the vision of the congregants and the vision of the architect you hired that we actually have this space to be in right now. It may seem ordinary to us, but at one time it was completely extraordinary. And as we move forward, there are possibilities for other extraordinary futures to arise. The entire process that has brought us to where we are today began with a series of visioning sessions with congregants identifying the BUC of the future. 
The CDPC was convened as an ad hoc committee by the board and began the process of getting information from congregants and program groups regarding what they wanted and needed for that future. They spent hundreds of hours of careful and diligent work on this. Some of those committee members are here today, not everybody could be here. All of this information was compiled and prioritized through a very exacting process, which we talked to you about at the annual meeting last May. So I'm not gonna go through that whole thing again today. But here's what has occurred since the annual meeting last May. Also in May, but after the congregational meeting, the board decided to retain an outside consultant to conduct a feasibility study to determine how much we could reasonably expect to raise in a campaign. And a committee convened by the executive interviewed two such firms. We hired CCS consultants from Chicago, and they began their own process of listening to congregant priorities, determine likely, likely monetary support for the project, and identifying member volunteers to perform the outreach for donations. The CCS process indicated that we should establish a target of $1.6 million for our campaign. Reverend Dr. Kathy Hurt and I agreed to co-chair the effort, and we hired CCS to manage the campaign for us. We didn't have anybody in the congregation who had that particular skill set, and we were very impressed with the work that CCS did with us in the feasibility study. They did it brilliantly. Over 30 congregants were involved in the whole process of fundraising, of meeting with people in their homes, of making phone calls, of having conversations, of doing announcements on Sunday mornings. And what's really remarkable to me is that when we asked people if they would participate, almost everyone said yes immediately and didn't have to think about it. it it's an idea that time, whose time has come. Okay, so we did that in May of 2014. Also in May of 2014, a process was initiated to choose an architect for our project. The repairs and renovations we needed to do required architectural services. The CDPC enlisted BUC's member architects, Frank Arvin, Keith Brown, John Hammer, and Steve Laurie, to identify potential architectural firms and help in the review. From a field of five, Inform Studio was selected in July 2014, and they began to overlay their own process to glean stakeholder needs and wants. Frank, Keith, and John continued to advise CDPC, and Steve is still part of the CDPC. We initiated what essentially were parallel processes. The fundraising process and the process of designing architectural solutions to our most pressing issues. It is not an accident that the architects we chose to work with are known for their visionary thinking. It fits us quite well. We began the early stages of the capital campaign in October, and at the same time, the CDPC was working with the architects. The solutions they presented were visionary beyond anything we might have imagined. In December, they presented their rendering to the congregation. We believe that the possibility in particular for the south side of the building, or the entrance area and the foyer and the connector to the commons, will give us a facility that is much more attractive both to congregants and to newcomers and to visitors and will make this a, a welcoming place at a level we haven't experienced to date. We've attempted all along in the process to um, keep our expectations within the boundaries of the capital campaign target. There may be some slippage there, because there are some things that we might really want that might cost a little more money. But Dick Cantley, who has chaired the CDPC since the beginning of this process, will introduce his committee and review the anticipated projects and uh, anticipated costs for us. Thanks, Lisa. I thought you were going to say Dick Cantley was going to write a check. <laughs> um, 
I want to especially thank, uh, it's going on two years as Lisa mentioned, and by May I think hundreds of hours will become uh, in the thousands that Pam Graham, Sharon Kirchner, Jim Shettle, into Davis, Jim Clark, Steve Laurie, and Karen Stanky have put in. And then additionally, uh, the three other uh, congregate architects, Frank Arvin, Keith Brown, and John Hammer, uh, are helping guide this process. And I also want to recognize Stephen and Appa Deering, uh, Kimry Campbell, and Eleanor, Eleanor McGuire, because they have put a lot of hours and thought into this for their respective programs as well. And I was kind of struck by a number. Uh, early on, by the way, Craig Stroop also helped us out. Uh, when you add together the eight board members and, Ken, and Reverend Hurt and the people on the CDPC plus the architects, uh, there are about two dozen people who have directly, in some one hands-on way or another, helped shape uh, the uh, the projects. And add to that the over 30 people that uh, were, have been involved in the capital campaign, and a number really struck me, and that was that um, one out of eight congregants have been directly involved in either the process of design uh, and meeting the needs of the programs in the church or asking for the money to do that. And I think that's a, that's a pretty impressive number. Um, I don't know what we've got up. If you take the next one. I'm going to do a really short review uh, because I want to leave plenty of time for questions and comments of the accessible and welcoming scenario that, that Inform Studio uh, put together for us. And it'll fall into three parts. One are the aspirations, which frankly have changed since we, since we started the process and have been going through the process. The challenges, what else? Money. Uh, and then what next? Not, not about the plan, but what happens next to get us to the point where we can make a recommendation uh, to this congregation in May and move forward with our projects. So, Jim, if you'd put up the... This is our existing uh, floor plan, and I'll remind you of the urgent and essential uh, repairs that we were talking about. That is the commons connector, the main entrance and skylight and foyer, sidewalk, our classroom interiors, improved site drainage and the elevator, which have both, we've made a lot of progress on that anyway. Our parking lot and exterior lighting, uh, freshening of the social hall, remodeling of all the bathrooms, uh, some HVAC work, and then technology for controlling, well, for security and for, for controlling HVAC. And the next slide shows the architect's areas of remediation, for those of you that will recall that. Their focus is going to be on the making the north area uh, accessible and uh, adding some storage and really reconfiguring that area uh, to improve it. Uh, and then the entryway area and, the, si and, the, and the, the total entry experience that you have coming into the church. In addition to that, remember we'll be doing, we're touching a lot of areas. We'll be working on the, refreshing the social hall, remodeling all the restrooms, and all of those color door rooms would also be refreshed. The north area remedi remediation, and music, please don't get upset. Cla they just put classroom there for a, for a placeholder. Um, this, I'm, I'm really impressed with what Inform did here because basically they've, they've taken a, a really disjointed group of buildings and put together a plan whereby anybody parents picking up children, children getting to class, somebody who has accessibility issues, anybody now with this, with these changes will be able to go from the pavilion through all of those rooms indoors, regardless of the weather, and um, in a, with an incline that allows a wheelchair to get through as well. Uh, it's all accessible, they've consolidated the storage in the restrooms, and I think it's a really cool solution that none of us had thought of. The south area remediation, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this and we don't want to get hung up on the details, uh, but the north area is accessible from the pavilion by moving the entryway out, Inform proposes that we, with a gentle 1 in 20 slope, make everything from the front entrance to the entire rest of the campus, with the exception of the two bathrooms downstairs in the social hall, completely accessible right from the entryway. So this is a view of 
a concept, uh, the kind of quality, this may not be the final design of the front entryway, but this is the kind of quality that Inform was, uh, was working toward. Uh, go to the next slide. Here's a section, again, refresh your memories, on the left-hand side. We've got to go to the next slide. No? no? Put them in reverse order. Back up. Oh. That's the section. <laughs> That's right, the numbers at the bottom of the credit pages are crossed out. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Entering from the front door on the left, uh, this, the, the floor gently slopes again from the front door down to the top of the stairways, which would again itself slope on down. Barb mentioned this morning that uh, this design really blends with and complements the Yamasaki design of the campus, if you'll notice the vertical lines and the windows and that sort of thing. It obviously goes beyond just fixing stuff. It gives us full accessibility and a very welcoming entryway. So we'll go to some numbers. And these are the project cost as it's estimated today only. And I'll get to some other numbers in a minute. Um, implementation of the current informed designs are just under 1.2 million as an estimate. We will have spent, by the time we get to the, to the end of this, about $135,000 on the architect, about $105,000 on capital campaign costs, and I think we've gotten and will continue to get a great return on the investment for those dollars. Add into that the parking lot, the external lighting, uh, repairing the sidewalk, and the other items that we've already talked about, social hall, restrooms, uh, some furnishings are involved. We would estimate the total project, without any contingencies, that the total projects would be about 1.7 million. And all of our urgent and essential, um, everything that we had on the urgent and essential list is remediated with completion of this scenario. Next, I mean, hang on just a minute, Jim. Um, these numbers you're going to see next are what I call the ugly numbers, but I want you to know that they're ugly on purpose. We wanted to be very defensive and very conservative in them, and uh, this is where our work is really going to begin. So carrying over the 1.7 million in an estimated project uh, total, we're going to make an assumption that we will lose rental and other income that would total $55,000. Now, that's an assumption that I think is, that we'll be able to remediate quite a bit. But we're going to put the ugly dollars in as opposed to just a mid-range. Cost of construction financing, I think we can do a lot about that to drive it down, but I'm going to put $45,000 in anyway. Capital expenditure for future leaks or whatever uh, might happen to the roof and so on and so forth. And then we've thrown another $175,000 in just for contingency. You don't know what you don't know. And don't burn these numbers, I mean remember these numbers, but I expect they will be considerably different when we come back with a, for, with a proposal to you in May. The capital campaign, if we achieve our target of 1.6 million, there are about $75,000 in designated and other funds in the church. So the total projected funds available against the number that I didn't say above, the potential capital requirements, would leave us about $350,000 short in order to uh, fund the difference between our means, if you will, um, and um, a very negative look at what might happen if things go wrong during the course of things. Uh, except for the CapEx uh, and consistent with quality results, we're going to drill down through these numbers and challenge all the assumptions behind every one of those numbers uh, to bring them down. And the next slide, here's how. And I have to thank John Hammer quite a bit for some process advice on this. But we're in the interview process right now to hire a construction manager to work with Inform as they move through their design development process and the CDPC to first get 
truer cost estimates. And the second point is the most important one. We're going to engage in a value. This is where the real work starts. We're going to engage in a new term I learned from John Hammer, a value engineering process to minimize the cost consistent with a quality result. And that means examining every piece of the puzzle as we move through it. I think there are a lot of things that we can do uh, with a construction manager, working with the architect and, and, and working together to, to really move those figures quite a bit. Um, we will work with the CDP, have the construction manager work with the CDP and the staff to, to schedule in a way that minimizes losses in rental and other income. I think there's a lot we can do there. We'll develop a construction schedule and, and, and we would plan to proceed with reno renovations to the north area, social hall, some of the restrooms, uh, which are not controversial really. We'll, we'll do those in, in any kind of a scenario. Develop a construction finance plan, uh, plan that minimizes interest costs, uh, and there are a number of ways to do that. And if a capital shortfall is projected for the project, develop a plan to deal with the shortfall. And it isn't just getting financing, it's integrating that into the budget if we need it. Do I expect the kind of shortfall that I showed on the ugly number sheet? No. Do I expect it to be zero? No in terms of the, the gap between our means uh, and, uh, and the ultimate cost of the project. But by May, when we put it to vote with the congregation, we will have some pretty real numbers and know right where we are. Um, in May, I don't know the date of that meeting, but in May we'll... Re 17th. May 17th, we'll report to the BUC congregation on the, re the results of the above step and present a recommendation to move forward uh, at that meeting. And at this stage, uh, I'll open it up to questions. And I hope I hope I haven't poured too much water with putting the ugly uh, on things, putting the ugly numbers up there. But that's a starting point that we will where the real work begins to to ratchet it down. Uh, and as Lisa said, we want to open it up to questions. Uh, you can direct them to whomever you like up here, and uh, we want to have it be very open and want it to be uh, a process where you get to know what you need to, to know in order to vote at that May meeting. We are recording this, um, this meeting, so we're requesting that you speak into the microphone so that it can be on the recording. And that will be on the website so that people who are not here are able to see it afterwards. And so please raise your hand and we'll bring you a mic. I feel like I came to this party late since I missed the December meeting and I probably don't understand finance very well, but the develop a finance plan that minimizes interest cost is confusing. If we have all of the money donated, all of the money available, where would the interest cost come? Well, the, the point is that we, we may not have all the money available. I don't discount that we may come up with some terrific thoughts during the process of, of value engineering and working with a construction manager. It's conceivable that we'll have enough money to do everything that I put up there, which I recognize was a pretty short look at it. Uh, but it's likely that we will fall short of enough money to do that. And so that would require a mortgage or bonds or pre pledged asset lending or some kind of a, a financing program that you'd then we would then have to integrate into the budget. So if the congregation, you present this in May, the congregation, do we have to accept it or vote on it or anything? Oh, yes. It, oh, okay. it would be a congregational vote. But we, after that, if we ended up borrowing money, we would not have a vote. No, that vote would include the authority to, to move okay. forward to do that. All right. I have one other question. I, I didn't see the... Uh, front entrance plan very well from back here, but it looks as if you have not included another conference room, that there are only two conference rooms on that sheet, despite the fact that we've talked forever and ever and ever about needing a third conference room, mm -hmm. and the enormous area of seating for people doesn't account for an area for the teenagers to have a place to hang out. 
So I, won't, I would like those two things noted very clearly because I'm not sure, I love our teenagers, I'm not sure we want visitors to come into our beautiful entrance and see them lying around on the sofas, which they do. And they should be able to do, but they should have their own space to do it. Uh, well, you know, sometimes that's, we'd like to hide them, but those are the two things that I think are really important. Grace, let me respond to the beginning part of your question. This is a five-year campaign, so all of the pledged funds will not be received for five years. But the construction will be completed prior to that time. So there will need to be a period of time when, we have, when we're using borrowed funds until all of the pledges are, are completed. Can you uh, put on the slide that shows the ugly numbers again, please? Mm -hmm. You can guess the one word that caught my attention. Uh, loss of rental and other income in rummage. What's, uh, what's the prediction on that loss of income having to do with rummage? The, 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 the assumption in those numbers is that we would miss one rummage sale. The, the intent is that we would, working with the construction manager, schedule things so that we miss no rummage sales. Thank you. I'm sorry, in the slide work. Uh, yeah, um, I was wondering. I don't. I'm. I'm not quite sure where the geothermal for the social hall comes in here. That's already been started, and for which Ernie Hodes very generously left funds, and which we will earn a great deal of money back and savings on heating the church, heating the social hall the minute we put it in. Would you explain that for me? Yeah, the the funds are set aside for that purpose. Uh, the intent is to move forward with it. The things that we don't know yet for example will uh, will the uh, will we be able to get it permitted to dump the water and that sort of thing so is there a hundred percent promise that there'll be a geothermal th furnace there I, c I can't make that because there's still some unknowns but that is the intent and and we will be we've had some emails back and forth and some dis discussion just in the last few days and we will make that part of the communications too as we go forward retired builder <clears throat> and I can tell you from my experience that if you have a project that's gonna last five years you can almost expect almost a double cost increase and uh, you could keep this in mind I have a suggestion of a major change you know the the ramp from the front entrance down to the level of our of the sanctuary is about four feet plus or minus rather than make that ramp which is really really a, a very uh, major change in the design of our building is to have a elevator going through our storage area to the uh, to the room downstairs and that way we could fulfill our obligations to uh, handicapped people and normal people can take the regular route which is I think okay well the the um, that may be some kind of a lift and that sort of thing may ultimately have to be considered depending upon how the dollars and, the, and that is part of our conversation by the way the project won't last five years the funding is spread out over five years that that is the uh, the um, the pledges are coming in over a period of five years, but we're not going to we're not going to have a five-year project. It'll be a maximum two-year project.
The first thing I want to say is, I want to, on behalf of the BUC community, I'd like to thank the board and the CDPC for changing the format of this meeting to informational only. I was one of the people who felt that we didn't have enough information yet to make any kind of decisions, and so I applaud their, their action today. Uh, I've got a couple of comments. One about the geothermal. Uh, it seems to me that that's an awfully, in my, in my opinion, wasteful way using well water and pumping it into the sewer system. Where's the green sanctuary on that? There are other geothermal ways of, of providing heat, like grids under parking lots and so forth. And I personally would prefer to see something like a closed system that doesn't waste precious resources like water. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is I understand from this morning's um, announcement that the capital campaign has raised 1.4 million over five years. Is that correct? So far. The capital campaign was ended last, last Sunday, I understood. Just like a pledge drive, <laughs> it, it's, it's never quite over. Okay, okay, we're still $200,000 below the goal. Yep. We are $600,000 below your ugly number. And I think before we do anything else, we need to make sure at the May meeting that we know how those numbers are going to be uh, fulfilled, how we're going to fulfill that cost. And I realize you're going to take every, every uh, means you can to lower the cost. Um, but I, for one, do not want to see a mortgage that's going to last 15, 20, 30 years in the future. One of the things we, asked about, we were asked about today was the future of, of this organization and the folks that are here to come. And I don't want to burden them with mortgage payments of 350000 or four hundred or $500,000 uh, accumulated debt over the next 20 or 30 years. Thank you. My question is somewhat related to what Don just talked about. Um, as the analysis is done between now and the annual meeting, will that include developing a plan B that will show what the project would look like if we were to spend only the money that is pledged? Uh, well, we're going to make a recommendation. A plan B would be to just fix stuff. And we can, there's no question we can do that with the funds that we have. Uh, if we get a no vote, then we'd go back to the drawing board and bring back another proposal consistent with the will of the congregation at that point regarding money. So are you saying that there would be no option of a, a plan B that would that would be the $1.4 million worth of work? Not from a voting standpoint at that point, no. We wouldn't do, because we, we do want to make a recommendation based on what we think is going to be, you know, what this group that's been working on it for so long thinks is the best option, along with the board, uh, for, the, for, the, for the church going forward. But, um, we thought about more than one option, thought about two options, thought about three options, and then you get into, well, why not halfway between this and that, you know, that kind of thing. So I'd rather us make a, I think we'd all rather have us make a proposal, uh, and if that proposal fails, go back, and we'll, we'll know at that point what the will of the congregation is, and we can come back with plan B. Thank you. That's helpful to know. Thanks. There can't, there can't not be any more questions. <laughs> uh, just, a, just a quick one. I've heard the term bridge loan put out in the past. Don made allusion to a very long mortgage leaving. When you do the presentation, could you also provide us with the estimated term over which the property would be potentially at risk in terms of a lien or anything like that? Yeah, even beyond that, we would present you with how, it, if, if we do have to borrow money, what the payments would be and how that would be integrated into the budget. One line I missed too is, don't forget that we will be able to 
I think, with a, with a much improved church, improve our, grow our membership, which brings in additional pledge dollars, and also we ought to uh, be able to uh, get a little more rental income, uh, either with additional or raising the ones that we have. And those numbers are positive numbers, but again, I, I only wanted to put the ugly ones up, so. Grace? We have one over there, and then we have somebody over here. Yes. <clears throat> Um, you almost answered my question partly. Uh, is the church growing? And you expect this to help with that? And the other question is, what about the other churches in the area? Are they doing something similar? Are they expecting growth? If what I, environment, what kind of larger you environment? You have the microphone in your mouth, some people can't hear you. Sorry. What larger environment is Unitarianism dealing with in this area? And we're not alone, are we? Can I defer to the to Reverend Hurd on this one? Yes. I don't. Smart. Gee, thanks. <laughs> Can I say hell now? <laughs> Uh, if you read virtually any kind of media, you know that churches of all kinds are not growing. And I wish I could say that Unitarian Universalist congregations were the exception to that, but we're not. Uh, Catholic churches are shrinking, Protestant churches are shrinking, Jewish congregations are shrinking, and Unitarian Universalist congregations are shrinking. And there's a lot of complex reasons for that phenomenon, but every church is experiencing that, and every church is uh, somewhat frantically trying to figure out what do we need to do to remain viable institutions. And nobody has come up with a magic answer yet for every lovely story that comes out about one particular congregation somewhere that is indeed growing by leaps and bounds. If you poke a little bit deeper into that, you discover that there were some fairly complex reasons for that growth, just as there are complex reasons for shrinkage. Uh, over time, this congregation is not as large as it used to be. That's in part a factor of, over time, a more rigorous application of what our requirements are for membership so that less and less we simply have somebody's name on there because once upon a time they ask us to put their name on there so that we end up with membership numbers that are actually people who are actively engaged in the congregation, not just people whose names are on the roster. Also, over that period of time, those of you who have been longer residents of this state than I have know that there have been tremendous upheavals in the uh, living situation of many people here, which meant shrinkage in all sorts of places, not just in the church. During the, the, the time that I have known you, uh, our membership has shrunk in terms of members being removed from the role because they were no longer active and gained because of new people coming to the congregation. Overall, the decline has gone faster than the gain, but again, we're representative of many churches and, and virtually all churches in that respect. Uh, making ourselves more presentable would only seem to help with that trend. It won't by itself be enough of an answer to reverse that trend, but it can, I would think, help. That's a long answer to a question that actually deserves an even longer answer, but I'll start there. Um, Sylvia, I'm not going to ask Sylvia to stand up because she just recently, really? Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Sylvia Whitmer, a member since about 68. We have definitely gone through these decisions before and um, I particularly remember the one for this sanctuary. It was very tumultuous and in this people had very definite opinions that didn't agree. <laughs> As a result, unfortunately, we did have a few members that we lost, valuable members that we lost of it. But once completed, 
we had this beautiful building and an increase in membership, not to mention enthusiasm. So uh, if I recall, and somebody might correct this, the interest we paid at that time on the mortgage we took out was 9%. Uh, one of the things I would like to talk about is hurrying up on a new mortgage <laughs> while it's low. But I do want to remember um, a few things of the, of the past, and one in particular is that I have been the chair of the RE committee for at least five of the past ten years. I know the people who come to visit. <laughs> they are very interested for their families. And they're usually enthusiastic about our message. But then they look at the down at heels because the construction we've done in the past is this for primarily our adults. The next construction we did was a social hall. Again, primarily the adult population. And if you look at what we have, we don't have a single space. We have the commons. We cannot put all our children, let alone their parents, with them at a meeting. There's no place for that kind of thing, so we can't gather them. It is time. Our kids are not uh, in second class of any sort. They are, in fact, part of our future. And I think that aims at some of the comments Grace made and I heard over there about who stays in our population. Two other pieces that I feel we need to think at this time are the mortgage interest rates, which is historically low, and we don't know how long it will stay. So in my letter to the board, I did include a rather dramatic graph showing the opportunity we have to get this done in time that we get the lowest interest rates. I do favor the mortgage in order to have something built in that's beyond just renovation. We need some kind of a dream left there if we're going to give monies to it. Certainly I feel that way. And lastly, I think we need to consider that we're in a good location. We're on the Woodward Corridor. We have opportunities for terrific marketing. Almost every municipality along the Woodward Corridor has a long-range plan that includes building opportunities on Woodward. Then we can have better accessibility, we can do better marketing, we have better transportation. So I think as we look at these um, items that you're considering, we need to consider all of those. Thank you. My comment doesn't go to a physical plant but it does go to the need for this church to grow. And in the national trend, if not possibly international trend in many areas, is to become more secular. And I think this is the one religion that can draw in humanists, atheists, and agnostics. And I think we have to get our message of welcoming to those groups of people who are out there looking for a religion that meets their needs. And I don't know how we can do that as Unitarians, but I think we should. David Brooks, uh, I have to bring this up because I'm going to send this article to the board members. David Brooks about a week ago had uh, an article that was right at the heart of what you've been talking about. It was an op-ed in the New York Times and, and uh, it essentially was, he didn't say Unitarian, but uh, th that's the kind of church that can serve the folks that are headed in the direction that our society's headed. Uh, just too brief the comments, I'm Ed Sharples. And uh, in terms of mortgages, I will remind the congregation that we are debt free. Until five, six years ago, we had three mortgages on this property. In order to remove those mortgages and have a burning of the mortgages, we raised $550,000 to pay off those three mortgages at a rate of interest not at all like what is available today. 
And secondly, I do want to thank the board, the architects, the committee for an extraordinarily honest and forward-looking presentation. Thank you so much. I do so appreciate the ones of you who are looking at the big picture and it's what Sylvia has to offer. I'm the person who looks at details and I don't like, I don't appreciate the, we're going to, I've forgotten what the words are, but spruce up the classrooms. Those classrooms have long needed new windows and new flooring and besides painting. And I guess I wonder what is really planned for the classrooms because they've been shoddy for a long long, long time. So I like to think of the details and let other people do the big. It's wonderful that they do it and you guys have done a great job. Uh, the, class, the word I used was refresh and I don't know what that means and and, the, and we won't know what that means until the, the, our architects get into it and, and the committee gets into it but uh, how far we can go will be somewhat dependent upon how much money we got. I appreciate your point though. Grace, some things about the classrooms is that the bathrooms that are currently in the classrooms will not be there any longer. There will be bathrooms that serve all of the classrooms. The classrooms will have an enclosed walkway to all of the classrooms. I believe they'll have new flooring. I think that flooring is the original flooring that's in there. And I think they will look completely different from how they look now. And the refreshing, the, the specific details, we can't can't say because if I say that to you now then you can come back and say but you said then we did this other thing so so we can say much more in May than we can say now Well, I want to say how impressed I am with the quality of the questions and of course this presentation. It's very moving to be part of such a thoughtful congregation. I only have one comment and it's that I am concerned that we not let fear drive our decisions. That we be visionary and act with strength for a, dr a dream for the future. Um, I have a question about the cash flow situation. For example, some people have already prepaid. We have, you said 75 in the church, I don't know if it's endowment or miscellaneous, available. In May, can we get some kind of a thing that shows here's what we have, here's the potential cash flow? Because I'm looking at this and I'm like, Okay, one of the key things here is going to be how are we going to handle the financing? How about the expenses versus the flow as it comes in? Mm -hmm. I think that Sylvia's point, which I had never thought about, yes, if we need a mortgage, why not pick it up while it's low rather than two years from now when it's beyond the point? So in May, can we get some kind of a... Absolutely. I mean, that's just integral to the plan. We have to have that the cash flow. Can we see it? Of course. Ballparks yeah. or something like that? No, no, I mean, we'll, at this stage of the game, at the end of December, we had about, about $300,000 had come in already as of December 31st. Now, 150 of that was, it's going out while it's coming in too. So we probably have a couple hundred thousand, at, north of 200,000 in uncommitted funds at this point that we can use to move forward and that'll grow as the year goes on. And so. that, that was my question, thank okay. you. I'd like to make one comment to all of you. Uh, there have been people who have expressed a concern that funds coming in for the capital campaign would get diverted to operating costs. The board established a policy that we will not use any funds that come in for the capital campaign for anything but the capital campaign. So be assured that the money will go to the right place and it won't be diverted to a capital emergency or an operational emergency or something. It will be for the campaign and only the campaign. Hi everybody, thanks for staying so long. This has been a really great conversation. What occurs to me that I'm hearing um, 
that may be like the, the conflict or the space in the heart is the building of the dream for the future and if we build it they will come and then building for people who are here now and <clears throat> I work in the very maligned and justly so at times field of advertising and I also will malign it barely occasionally in private conversation. The best form of advertising is word of mouth. When you invite someone to come with you who you think is of like mind or would find a spiritual home here. And I know there was a study, Kathy could speak to it or, or something years ago that said on average each Unitarian invites someone once every seven years. <laughs> That's not very good. So right now think about how many people you have invited. But I do think there is something to that word of mouth and inviting people if you feel good about it. And I, what I'm hearing and these conversations about the youth and the classrooms and all that, I wonder if maybe there needs to be a little thought about building for what's here now and who's here now and making the people who are members feel good about this, even if part of that is building for the future. And maybe it's just a way of rephrasing it or feeling like it's opening to that, but that's what the piece is that I'm hearing. I'm not sure about all of you, but that's the little piece I'm hearing. What she said reminded me that I was invited and that's why I came. I'm curious as to how many people here came because somebody invited them. Quite a few. Thank you. Uh, we've had a lot of things to my mind, clarified this uh, afternoon, but there's one thing that I'm still not entirely clear on. Um, I want to hark back to Annis's question about the geothermal. Um, it's Correct me if I'm wrong, please. It's my understanding, though, that the geothermal project is actually not part of the capital campaign. Is that right? Yes. It's independently funded and proceeding independently. Uh, well, the CDPC is going to coordinate well, okay. what well, happens. Uh, coordinated, yes, but it's not part of what we're discussing here or voting on in May. Is that correct? correct? That's correct. Okay, I think that uh, that's something we want to make quite clear um, because in talking to people, I've uh, identified that as one of the things they're not entirely clear about. Um, you all know that I'm pretty concerned about Green Sanctuary and, and where we're going with all that. And I appreciate that the uh, uh, geothermal system has been separately funded and so on and so forth to the degree that it is. Um, one thing that I think is important though is that um, we regard ourselves as a green sanctuary in all that we do. And what I'm looking at here in the pictures is wonderful, um, but what doesn't show up in the pictures that I know is there is a commitment to our green sanctuary uh, position. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak to how green values are being incorporated because I know in private conversations with several of you that that is a big part of what this plan is. Could you enlighten us in that way? Yeah, I think uh, as the architect that we've chosen is is extremely conscious of green initiatives and that'll be part of the process for them all the way through the, the design. Additionally, Karen Stanky on behalf of Green Sanctuary made a, uh, a presentation to the board uh, urging that we, and we'll have to figure out the language ultimately, but urging that we uh, be mindful in our, in our uh, choosing of contractors, that materials are disposed of property, properly, and that uh, materials that we're going to be using are sourced and and uh, handled in a, you know, are, are as green as they can be. And that's one of the unknowns along with, along with uh, wage, um, um, the wages, what the wages will be when we, when we do our construction and what the material costs will be as, as we do our construction. In addition, there are some unknowns with respect to what, 
you know, there's going to be a low cost to that, but I'm not saying it's not worth the cost, but that's part of that $175,000 number that I have up there as part of the unknowns. But uh, Karen has done a great job representing you folks, both in the CDPC and to the board, and we hear it loud and clear. And um, we've had one... Um, uh, construction manager interview so far and and we were pleased to hear we've got three more coming up this week but we were pleased to hear from the construction manager he said that's the world we live in now you know so we'll keep we'll keep posted on on that but it is top of mind um, quick question and I'll follow up depending on the answer are we incorporating any plan for solar energy in this and roof panels or anything we aren't in the capital campaign it didn't I mean there were there were only so many things that we could put into the plans with the dollars that we anticipated having and some things such as accessibility you know rose to a higher level than that but there is a lot going on and again Karen and, and uh, Keith Brown and some others are there there's there are things going on the solar that might allow us to finance that separate from the capital campaign and without burdening our operating budget. I don't know, but we, we are exploring it. Uh, um, just to share our experience, um, like most of us, we're concerned about climate change and the rest of it. Um, I have looked at solar when we had to redo a roof on our house about 10 years ago, and it really didn't get close to a ballpark of making any sense by, mm -hmm. by you know, back of the envelope negotiate or calculations. We looked at it last summer and we're quite surprised to see that including driving our electric car, we could generate from our modest little 1400 square foot house in Birmingham enough power to cover our residential and driving needs. With a payback of the investment, we had to remortgage the house to do it, uh, a little under 10 years. <laughs> That means that it's free power after that. Mm -hmm. The universe of that evaluation changed so completely in the last decade that if anybody has any thoughts from what they knew five years ago, you need to look at it again. Yeah. And I was very pleased to find that we could do it. Um, and just anecdotally, when your project's done, then you start the regulatory countdown, and it took uh, nearly four months. <laughs> It was ready to go. We couldn't turn it on yeah. until about two weeks ago. And it was ready on October 15th. Well, there you go. Thanks. I'm Priscilla Hildum. Um, I was treasurer during the entire construction of this part of the um, facility and we did borrow about six hundred thousand dollars I don't remember the large um, amount but two hundred and fifty thousand of that was borrowed from the UUA and the condition was that we were a full fair uh, contributing organization which we were at the time and I don't have any idea whether they still have that program there requirement their their operation was one percent over the figure you'll find for mortgages and as I remember that was close to five percent if you looked it up and so we were paying six percent for 250,000 from the UUA which was less than the 350,000 mm -hmm. loan I just thought that might be uh, an angle we should remember. Yeah, we uh, to, just a point. We are we are not fully paying yet, but we are not paying zero like we were for a period of time. We're up to you know people have been very generous with checking the box off, and I hope they will continue that. But we're up about close to half, Kim. Yeah. They keep trickling in. We're like the pledges. They keep trickling in. <laughs> so thank you. Okay. Am I next? Okay. Um, I'm Mary Hoffmeyer. Um, I've been on the membership committee for uh, over a year, and we do talk every time we meet about the, you know the the. Uh, situation of, of having a declining membership rather than an increase and what what can we do and so on this is something uh, I don't know whether this is included in any of the overall plan but 
accessibility and visibility from passers-by. Um, if you think about what uh, normally if you're driving down the freeway and you see a billboard, it's facing you. If you're out on Lone Pine, our, the sign that says Birmingham Unitarian Church is parallel to the road, which means you don't see it until you're right next to it, and you're, you're gone. I mean, that to me, there are simple things that would make us more, uh, more visible, more noticeable, and also having some kind of signage or lettering, tasteful, subtle, discreet, whatever, but something so that when people do finally make it in one of the driveways, they know they're in the right place. Because mm -hmm. if you come in off of, off of Lone Pine, there's nothing there that says this is a church. You don't know for sure if you're in the right place. And because there's nothing big enough to see until you're right up close to it, it makes it difficult. And I don't know, is that is signage or, or uh, decorating any part of? It's not part of these dollars. Okay. And some of this may be, may be something that's so simple that it just means somebody making an effort to turn a, turn a sign 90 degrees, or, unless Birmingham won't allow that. But there's got to be some way of making it known who we are and that we're here. We're never gonna attract people <clears throat> on our own. I'm John Lake. I have a question that relates to some other concerns that we have. Uh, have we taken care of the, um, the flooding problem that we had? Uh, are we set to take care of it again if it occurs? And what about the parking lot? That was always something we said we needed to do to redo the parking lot. I'm talking about things that a lot of people think are concerns up and above, maybe. Yeah, Jim Shettle and the staff here have gotten, have made good progress on that, and there are a couple of other things, along with John Hammer helping out, there are a couple of other things that they want to do when the weather breaks, but it looks like they have, you know, unless there's an extraordinary rain, it looks like they've gone a long way toward beating the flooding thing. And the parking lot is included in those numbers. That's part of parking lot and exterior lighting uh, are part of that. John, we just can't do the parking lot till the end because yeah. if we bring construction equipment in to do other things, it, they would mess up the parking lot if we do it sooner. Yeah. If you have other questions or comments, please send them on to us. Send them to the board. Our email addresses are in the website. We will post the video. We will uh, keep you informed as much as possible. And we will give you information ahead of time for the vote. I want to ask you a couple of things before we close, if I could. I'd like to go back to the one of the questions I asked you at the very beginning, and that was, what is the legacy you wish to leave for future generations? And uh, to talk about what Susie has to say, what is the space you want to walk into on Sunday mornings or when you come to meetings? Because it'll be the same space that you leave as a legacy for the future. So thank you so much for being here. I appreciate your questions. I appreciate the mindfulness of this conversation. And I just love how we are together. Thank you.